Good afternoon, David. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. And you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, where, where are you calling in from? I'm just curious. I'm in Glasgow. I thought so with the accent. I'm a little south of you. So um, good, good to have you uh, with us on API Days. Whilst you're loading your screen, um, your, your slide, sorry, um, uh, I would like you just to say a little bit about yourself and, and where you're from. I've already introduced you, but just to expand on that. And as soon as we can see your slides, I'll let you know. OK. Uh, so yeah, I'm David Stewart. I'm from the Approve team. So we are a security solution for APIs, particularly those ones that service remote clients, such as mobile apps and IoT devices. Yeah, Dave, we can now see your your screen loud and proud. Um, API abuse, comprehension, and prevention. The very best of luck. I'll be back here with you in 20 minutes to ask you some questions. Good luck. All right. To you. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, as it says on the slide, is uh, API abuse. I'm going to explain what that is, why people do it, and most important of all, um, what you can do about it. So uh, the first thing to think about is uh, why on earth would anybody abuse your API? And there are actually lots of reasons. Um, just to be flippant for a moment, the, the summary reason is because they can. Um, so if there's a way in which people can make use of your API um, for personal or gain or for messing up your platform or whatever they, they have in mind, then they will. So any sort of pinhole in your uh, security defenses uh, will be exploited by somebody eventually. And there are, of course, some common um, you know, activities associated with API abuse, and I won't go through all of these, but, you know, you can think about, um, you know, account creation. Um, account creation is a, is a very common mechanism that can be automated via an API and a script to create loads of accounts. Um, if you're thinking financial services, then you might be thinking about, well, you could use these accounts for, I don't know, laundering money or moving, moving money around between countries, perhaps. Um, but it can be even actually much simpler than that. Let's say there's a reward for every account that gets opened, you get you know, three months Netflix. Then somebody might think, okay, I'll, I'll create 100 accounts and I'll get lots of Netflix and I can either use them or resell them. So the, the, the reasons for doing API abuse can be uh, very simple and very complicated. They can be done by um, you know, relatively inexperienced people to you know, extremely sophisticated uh, organizations and groups of people. Um, so you really have to be very vigilant about all of these different uh, different threats that are out there. Is it a real thing? Well, yeah, it's a real thing. And um, there are many, many examples of this. And FinTech is is a particularly juicy target, uh, unfortunately. And you, you do see lots of examples of um, uh, people, uh, you know, platforms being uh, abused via their APIs. I'm going to go into a bit more detail about, you know, how people do this in a moment. But um, I think it's one of the one of the things about doing these kinds of presentations is there are always uh, great examples that you can use, and these ones are, um, you know, serious examples. But sometimes I like to just have a bit of fun. This is actually one from last week, which is uh, a guy who created a a script to, to basically establish uh, which McDonald's branches had uh, ice cream machines that were broken because he was getting fed up with turning up a, um, a branch to discover that there was no ice cream available. And this was done, of course, via McDonald's API. And he built a script to uh, mimic the behavior of the mobile app and to actually find out if you could order ice cream because if the machine's not working, you can't order it. So you could use that information to establish whether the machine was working or not. The most interesting part about this story was that initially uh, his script didn't work because it was, you know, sequencing around the stores. It was operating at a particular frequency, and the McDonald's back end triggered uh, on that and said, "Oh, something weird's going on here, so I'm going to block this." Um, but it wasn't very long before he was able to work around that just by, you know, introducing a bit more randomness, if you like, into the activities that he was doing. And, th and that mimics very closely what we've seen in the, in the fintech space, where we see people opening accounts, doing two transactions, and then doing nothing for 25 days, and then coming back and doing another four transactions, etc. They, they're quite sophisticated in the way, in the way they operate to try to, to try to get around, if you like, regular um, security measures like rate limiting um, that might be in place. 
So sophisticated people out there. As I mentioned, um, EarthThings Mobile, and um, I want to talk about that, not just because it's EarthThing, but also because it's the most difficult um, channel to, to defend against for a couple of reasons that I'll mention. First one is that um, your mobile app can be downloaded by anyone um, and they can spend as much time as they like studying it, studying the API protocols, um, looking at the traffic, uh, reverse engineering it if they want, pulling out credentials and secrets from the app if they can, et cetera. So it's, it's, you need to assume that the app itself is unsafe and it's coming at you from an unsafe environment. The second thing to notice is that the app itself is actually a bit of a barrier. Um, it, 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 it creates a, a natural um, rate limiter, if you like, because within the app, you'll find um, that you, you know, it's typically one user logged in, he's typically doing one thing. Therefore, that, that naturally constrains the amount of data coming back from the, the back end systems. Whereas once you attach a script or a bot to the API, you may find that you can pull a lot more information out of it very, very quickly. So it can be um, not just difficult to defend, but if it is breached, it can be quite significant. So I want to talk about two different flavors of API abuse here. And actually, um, the previous speaker was talking about the OWASP top 10, um, which is a very useful and, and valuable thing and certainly something you should pay attention on. And that's really this kind of left-hand picture here, which is you know, flaws and, 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 um, and bugs that are within your API that can be exploited. Um, on the right-hand side is really what I want to talk about mainly today, which is the, the not, not exploiting a flaw in your API. Actually, the scripts that are being created are using your API entirely as it's, as it's intended. But the fact is the, um, the traffic's coming from a script, which is impersonating the mobile app traffic and uh, most likely using valid credentials as well. So um, it makes it very difficult to detect um, for traditional uh, network security uh, solutions. And as an aside, it also provides some um, protection against the vulnerabilities on the left-hand side, because if you do have flaws in your, in your API, which of course you should fix, but while, you, while they do exist, they're most likely to be exploited by a script. So if you're able to block scripts, then you can also protect yourself against any flaws in your APIs being, uh, being exploited. So how come we know so much about this? Well, of course, as I mentioned, this is what we do. Um, this is an example. Papara is a fintech um, based in Turkey. It's been growing very quickly. We've been working with them for, I don't know, 18 months, two years, um, during which time they've grown, I think, probably by about a factor of 10. Um, so they're growing really, really fast and doing lots of really interesting stuff but they also have been attracting quite a bit of uh, fraudulent activity of all kinds of different uh, different dimensions. So um, whether it's, you know, opening, opening personal accounts and using them for business purposes um, to, to avoid having to pay fees, whether it's, um, you know, the loyalty, you know, picking up loyalty rewards for using accounts or opening accounts, whether it's, um, you know, phishing attacks on websites being used to harvest credentials, which are then used inside a script. All of the things that I'm discussing are done via automated uh, traffic sources, such as uh, scripts and bots. Um, and working with us, um, they were able to reduce the costs um, they were incurring uh, by more than 90% in a 30-day period. And we've continued to work with them since, since they did that uh, a while back. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to walk through the, the kind of five things that you can do about this kind of traffic in your in your platform. And, um, you know, one of the things I would challenge you to think about is you, you may be thinking, well, I don't have any of this going on in my platform. Well, the question I would ask yourself is, how do you know? Um, so because, as I said, this is, these guys are, are pretty sophisticated. So first thing you need to do is you need to block malicious bots and automated scripts. Well, I've been talking about scripts, and so it's uh, I've been talking about the damage they can do, so it's probably natural that you would expect you need to block that. Now, there's lots of research about um, the kind of secrets and API keys, et cetera, that are stored uh, in apps, and um, they do talk about the fact that you you know shouldn't store keys and secrets and URLs and things like that in the app because they can be used against you. Um, but the reality of the world is that sometimes you have to, um, and you know it's not always easy to just say don't do this um, because 
you've got a remote client that needs to identify itself to your um, backend endpoint. So how does it do that? So the, I would I would spin it slightly differently, and I would say. Uh, Obviously, it's good not to store things in the app if you can avoid it. But if there are certain things like API keys that you want to store in the app, then the question you should be asking yourself is, how do I make sure that if even if that API key is uh, is compromised or is or becomes you know in the public domain, that it can't be exploited at scale? And that is really the way to think about it. So, one way to do that is to require that your apps have to prove that they are your live, authentic, unmodified um, app before authorizing any API calls. So you're checking that not only is the are the credentials valid, but that they're coming from your app and that your app hasn't been modified in any way. Now, if you can do that, then you can be sure that you can block uh, any kind of automated uh, traffic on your API. And I will emphasize again that this kind of traffic, it's not going high frequency. It's not a DDoS type thing. It's going nice, low frequency. It looks exactly like a genuine user using the app. So how would you know that it was uh, that it was not a genuine user? The fintech sector is growing. The traffic in the fintech sector and these kind of attacks are growing really, really fast um, because there's well because there's money to be made. So um, it's really important that you don't just authenticate via the API key or whatever other mechanism you have, but that you make sure that the app is authentic as well. Second thing you need to do is make sure you reject any apps which are running in compromised environments. Now, compromised environments could be considered to be uh, root and jailbreak uh, devices, but uh, and and that's valid. But there are lots of other um, signatures that indicate a compromised environment too: emulators, debuggers, um, you know, hacking frameworks like Frida Exposed, etc. And I just uh, decided to pick this one today: uh, cloner apps, just because it's a less well understood um, vector. And um, there's a blog article that we've written about that, uh, which is quite detailed if you're interested in learning more. But the concept is you can download apps from the App Store, um, and those will allow you to run multiple instances of the same app, like a fintech app, on a single device. Which might sound great from a from a consumer's point of view because they can have you know all of their accounts open at the same time and things like that. But the way in which some of these apps, cloner apps, work is that they create some quite horrible uh, security holes within your uh, mobile platform, um, you know, breaking open the sandbox and things like that. So you really um, don't want to be allowing that. So um, there's a whole range of uh, environmental uh, checks that you should do uh, on where your app is running and make sure that uh, you you check that regularly, not just when you install the app. So it's not it's not a question of just checking when your app gets installed on the platform that it's a good platform. I mean, that's a good thing to do, but you need to do it uh, whenever the app launches, whenever your app launches. And obviously, uh, even better, you need to do it continually, you know, maybe every few minutes uh, during the app runtime to make sure that um, that everything's good. Um, and that way you can you can catch um, genuine app instances which are being manipulated uh, in a compromised environment. Step three is to secure your API calls. Now, um, I'm sure many of you already do this, and um, TLS is the general way of doing it. And there isn't anything in and of itself wrong with uh, TLS, but um, it needs to be implemented correctly. And you need to use all of its features, uh, including the uh, certificate pinning part. So the um, general view of TLS is it's, it's good. But um, there are many examples of it not being implemented correctly or not completely. So it's really important that you do it right, um, that you get it implemented correctly, that you use its full range of uh, features. Uh, we've got ex seen examples of people not implementing certificate pinning because they're scared about what will happen if they um, if they need to rotate their certificate and things like that. So again, um, it requires you to to get on top of this and to make sure that you uh, you have it properly implemented. Step four is to essentially not just rely on user authentication. Um, so user authentication is a good thing, um, but for example, credential stuffing is a very common uh, attack and it relies on uh, people protecting uh, backend endpoints simply by using um, you know, user, user authentication as a way to be sure that uh, you know what you're dealing with. So 
the point is that just because somebody somebody appears to present a, a valid set of uh, user credentials does not mean that that person is present and is uh, okay with the transaction that's being request requested. But again, if you if you bind together the um, the user authentication with some other factor um, that can be verified independently. I'm using the example here of uh, authenticating the mobile app, but you, anything that you can you can um, you can uh, independently verify can be used together with user authentication as a second factor to make sure that um, you don't just have you don't just know you know who you're dealing with, but also kind of what you're dealing with as well, and that will really um, significantly uh, raise the bar on the security and make it much more difficult for. For bad guys to uh, to exploit anything that's uh, your API in any way, and finally keep security capabilities up to date. Seems a bit obvious this, um, but it's a little bit more subtle than that. So there's two aspects to this. One is um, probably not a great idea to uh, to build your own uh, security solution. I mean, you might think it's a good idea. You've just got some problem you need to fix, so we'll get a guy to write some code that fixes that. But the problem is you then open up. Um, you know, uh, how do you keep it maintained? How do you deal with emerging threats, et cetera? And the second part of the uh, the equation is how long does it take you to update anything in it? Because this is this is the important part. It's not a question of getting security, you know, done at the beginning. You have to, you know, commit to it and you have to make sure you're updating things quickly. And mobile apps, again, create some, some, some difficult challenges here because they, um, to get to get an, an update into into a mobile app requires you to update the app, test it, release it to the store. Your customers need to download it. Then you have to wait until a sufficient percentage of them have it before you force the update, etc. And that can be days or weeks. Whereas you need a real, you need to be able to instantly over the air update uh, apps in the field with new security capabilities as threats emerge. That's a very important uh, capability to have. Okay, so those were your five steps, and if you do those five steps, um, then uh, you can reduce the uh, the costs associated with uh, fraudulent activities on your platform by a very significant amount. And um, we uh, would be happy to help you do that. So in the remaining minutes I've got here, I just want to give you a little bit of background into who we are. Um, we we have been around a while. Um, we where our, expe our expertise really is on. Um, deep uh, introspection of software on mobile platforms for security and also performance reasons. And about five years ago, we realized that we saw the sort of rise of APIs, we saw the rise of mobile, and we we realized that um, it's a really different, it's a different animal, and um, it really needs uh, a dedicated solution to really make sure that those APIs um, don't get fooled uh, by scripts and it's not going to be easy to come up with something like that. So we decided there was a need for a, a specialist solution to do this part of the puzzle. Um, and that's what we built. And uh, it was launched uh, late 2016. And um, we're very happy with, uh, with how, it's, uh, how it's developing. Um, this is a range of customers. Each one of these customers has a, a case study on our website, which you can go and read uh, in a lot more detail what exactly we do for them. And obviously, there's a set of customers that um, that are not public, um, although we do have a few more coming online shortly. Um, so in terms of what does Approve actually do, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail about what it does, but this little um, animation here will um, will help. So the concept of it is there's a cloud service that we operate. You've got an SDK that's in the mobile app. And when the mobile app launches, it does a sort of DNA test uh, of itself, which is controlled by the uh, a cloud service to see if the app is genuine, if it's present. Um, and a, a short lifetime token, um, a five minute token is delivered to the app, which then gets sent down your API to your backend that you can validate. So you can be sure that the API request uh, actually comes from your app. And uh, you don't have to, uh, any script will not be able to present, um, pass the DNA test or present um, a, a, a valid token. And this process is repeated every five minutes and it takes a very short period of time and it's completely invisible, invisible to your users so they won't even know that it's there. 
lots more information on that on the website. And finally, then, this is what API views should look like. This is uh, a dashboard from our analytics. And um, the green stuff along the bottom is your steady state user traffic, uh, all looking good. And then the red stuff is some uh, accelerated or, or raised traffic levels caused by somebody attempting uh, to uh, run a script against your API. And of course, um, it's all being all being rejected, uh, which is good. But the other thing that's good is you see that the green traffic is continuing as if nothing happened. Um, so as the, the slide says, only the analytics engine noticed that this took place. So following the five steps that I um, outlined earlier on, um, this is what API views can look like for you uh, as well. And that is my time up. Um, my email address is at the top, and I've also put a link to our resources page where you'll find videos, uh, application notes, um, information about the platforms that we support, um, and loads of other stuff. And so please feel free to have a look. And if you think that we can help, um, or you want us to give you some guidance on um, on how you secure your mobile channel, then um, then just get in touch. Thanks a lot. Dave, don't disappear. Thank you very, very much. That was brilliant. Thank you. Uh, particularly the buy versus build. That's the old age argument, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yes. And it, it, it often seems like an immediate saving because you, you think, well, let's just let's just do this, get it done and um, plug it, you know, plug a particular security hole, then move on. Um, but what you've done is you've you've signed yourself up to uh, maintaining it, and over time it will grow arms and legs and become bigger. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, of course, I didn't mention this, so thank you for asking the question, is that um, by working with somebody like us, you gain the benefit of the sort of aggregated experience of all of our customers, because obviously some of our customers will experience certain things that will cause us to enhance our solution in a certain way. And then of course that then becomes a benefit to all of our other customers. So you you, you kind of gain that sort of uh, group uh, group knowledge as well. Invaluable as well. Um, David, thank you very, very much for joining us at API Days. Everybody can rewatch uh, this clip and look at your um, presentation, your deck. Um, online. I would just like to say enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Um, keep healthy, keep safe, and thank you very, very much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.